Hello, everyone. This is W. A.K. William, host of the High Art on the Edge page. Today, we launched a brand new series called Surprise. Stephen Schnee, the CD junkie, and I discuss the relevance and importance of the great work by the Lightning Seeds. We discuss Ian Brody, the mastermind behind it all, his lyrics, his amazing ability to create that memorable hook and melody. We ranked albums and songs. In addition, we had a very special guest join us, Ian McNabb, frontman for the band Icicle Works and solo artist, as he got to share some of his tales while working with Ian Brody and other musicians. Sit back, enjoy our conversation, and surprise event number one, focusing on the band, The Lightning Seeds. Hello. How you doing out there? My name is W, host of the High Art on the Edge page. Happy Father's Day to all here on a beautiful Sunday in the Bay Area, June 18th. We're not here to talk about Father's Day. We're here to talk about our very first surprise event. What is surprise? This is our first event that showcases and highlights an artist. I'll be having a discussion with a friend of mine that I know appreciates this artist band, if you will, quite a bit. So during this event surprise, we're going to be talking about how this band artist has had an impact on our musical life. In the comments section, feel free to post anything you want related to our conversation. The idea of a surprise is in this discussion, we're going to talk about not only the impact of the band, but also we're going to do some rankings here of albums and songs. And today's first event, we are putting the spotlight on a band called The Lightning Seeds. And I want to bring in a very special guest, gentleman that I have really, really admire for his work that he's done his YouTube channel. And he's going to give you more about that information here. So let's bring in Steve Schnee, the CD junkie. Hello, Steve. How are you doing? Dabya, how are you? Thank you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, wanting to do this. Um, oh. Do you actually know why I reached out to you? Do, do, do I know why you reached out to me? Maybe yeah. because um, I lent you all my Lightning Seed CDs? No, not really. <laughs> you no, did. Uh, well, I, why don't you give it, us a little background on who you are and what you do? <clears throat> well, my name's Steve Schnee. Uh, uh, normally kind of just known as Schnee now because there's so many Steves out there, but not that many Schnees. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, I've, I've been a, a music journalist since my days in high school. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've written for all music guide and I've done liner notes and, and, uh, I had my own fanzine out in the late nineties called, uh, pop sided, uh, that I co-edited with my friend Jim. And we actually, uh, we probably covered lightning seeds, uh, because of course this was the late nineties. And, uh, but basically the last few years, last, I don't know, five, seven, ten years. Uh, I've had a YouTube channel where I orig or or originally started a show called "But Is It Power Pop," and it was just me with a stack of CDs saying, uh, "Oh, uh, you know, uh, the Money Lemon Drops, great pop, not exactly power pop, you know, power pop adjacent, maybe, you know." And I would just go through there, and then it turned into a whole bunch of different shows. That now my main uh, thing is uh, CD Junkie. And what CD Junkie is, it will spotlight an artist like Lightning Seeds, uh, which I've done in the past. And I will go through their catalog and talk about each album. 
And then uh, uh, if I can feature a, a, a medley of songs or whatever. And I also have a couple of radio shows on Mixcloud, radio shows, and I put, put that in um, quotes. Uh, one is called uh, Return of the Living 80s. And the most popular thing that I've ever done, I think, is something called This is Ski Lodge, which started as a Mixcloud show, which is sort of 60s soft pop, sunshine pop, uh, going into the early 70s. And, you know, covers everyone from the association and the turtles and the monkeys to the carpenters and things like that. And that turned into a live Tuesday night stream every Tuesday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, where I've got a great group of people that come together and they just listen to the music and uh, have conversations, you know, in the chat room. And it's it, it's a wonderful experience. It turned into merch. I actually have merch. We're almost completely sold out. Uh, and it, it's crazy. It's nuts. I'm very, uh, uh, humbled and proud. And I'd love to do this because I have that passion, that, that joy of music. I don't just want to say, Hey, look at me. I own this CD. I want to say, Hey, this makes me feel the way that I feel. I want you to feel that joy and that passion too. And that's why I create everything that I do from a, from a written review to a video review to a radio show. It's trying to connect to people emotionally. Yeah. You do such a wonderful job. And that's Thank one you. of the reasons why I have stayed, you know, connected to your work and why I reached out to you and your, your sense of appreciation for the history of the artists and in your reviews, in your, uh, YouTube clips and your shows, you really break it down for the viewer in a way that celebrates their work and honors it in a way that shows that you've done your homework and that mm -hmm. you respect that part of learning and educating us as fans of music. And um, yeah, so. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about doing what I do is the fact that the only thing that I really use when I'm making my videos is I'm terrible with dates. So I, I, right now I can't tell you what year this album came out, that album came out, no matter how much I love it. But so I'll have a list of the album titles and the year they came out. That's the only thing I reference. Everything else is stuck in here for some godforsaken reason. <laughs> I don't know how you keep it all together. By the way, you have a friend here named Gary Wilkerson. He says hello yes. from Austin, Texas. Yeah, Gary Wilkerson, uh, brother of Danny Wilkerson, who put out the best album of 2018. And so um, hello, Gary. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, much appreciated. So um, – I want to know before we actually get into our discussion about the lightning seeds, uh, are you a big fan of the kind of uh, early 80s, um, you know, synth pop, uh, post punk, anything like that? Absolutely. That's that's really my sweet spot. Even though Ski Lodge tends to be what I'm, what, people tune in for the eighties is really uh, basically 78 to 85 is my sweet spot of music. And the reason I got into the lightning seas was because of who Ian Brody was. He had been, uh, I first turned on to him when he was a, a member of, if anybody remembers the original mirrors. Nice. And they had two albums out. Uh, I think, gosh, it, one was called heart. Twango and Raw Beat, and the other one might have been self-titled uh, or could have been Heartbeat, but uh, that's how I got into him. And then I started seeing his name pop up on albums uh, production, you know, Echo and the Bunnymen and, uh, oh, God, there's so OMD. Uh, what was that? OMD? Uh, Pale Fountains, Colorfield. Yeah. Uh, he, he produced the third Icicle Works album. And uh, just a great, great, great producer. And um, <clears throat> uh, should I tell you how I got into the uh, Lightning Seeds or are we going to hit that soon? We're going to hit that right now. Okay. So everyone, we are now going to leap into our discussion about this amazing band that has a, had an impact on our lives. So let's retrace our steps, Steve. Tell us mm -hmm. How did, uh, when did it all begin for you, that experience? It, 
very rarely do I hear anything um, on the radio uh, first because I'm one of those nerds who, you know, someone will say, you know, oh, yeah, the new Human League album is top 40 and I'll go to the record store to buy the Human League album. And then I'll go, oh, what is this album by this this other band I've never heard of called, you know, Flock of Seagulls or whatever. And I'll buy that instead. So I'll take my money, you know, I'll, I'll have something else in mind, but I go, I've never heard this band. It looks interesting, but very rarely will I hear something on the radio. There's only been three instances where I've heard something on the radio that blew my mind. Number one was, uh, Paul Young, uh, wherever I lay my hat, that's my home, which is an incredible version of a Marvin Gaye song. Uh, and then, uh, it happened with Icicle Works and a song actually called Birds Fly, but we know it as Whisper to a Scream. And then the third time was was listening to KROQ when they said, here's a brand new band. It was an import single and they played a song called Pure. And just you could just see little bits and pieces of my brain because it was melting. And it was just, and I fell in love with it. And I had no idea it was Ian Brody until I went out and bought the single. And, and right then I just thought, okay, not only is this guy fantastic with what he did with the original mirrors and the band care, uh, but uh, he, he, you know, and his production, but boy, he, he's an amazing artist on his own. Cause I think that was the first time I actually heard him sing. Cause usually he was the guitar player. So that's going back all the way to 1989. Yes. 1989. Okay. That's pretty crazy, that narrative that you just shared, because that's very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. Up here in the Bay Area, we didn't have K-Rock, but we had Live 105, which was very groundbreaking at the time in terms of playing alternative music. Yeah. And I can clearly remember when Steve Masters, my favorite DJ at the time, played Pure, and I was gobsmacked. Instant, like, what is this? How can yeah. something sound so perfect? It yeah. literally, you know, and it, we, we, we're going to get into this discussion about his arrangements and music, his brilliant um, knack for the melody. But I remember when that out, and I'm glad you used the word import, when that album came out, Cloud Cuckoo Land, I got to Tower Records. You all remember Tower Records? Mm -hmm. Up in San Francisco, Columbus, right outside Little Italy Town. And I was looking for two albums, The Sundays, Reading, Writing, Arithmetic, mm -hmm. and Cloud Cuckoo Land. And they had them. And they were both like 20-something dollars Yeah, at the time. And so I bought both of them and fell in love instantaneously. Yeah. So that was kind of my first introduction to the band. And then kind of what you just showed there, did some more um, going down that wonderful rabbit hole. The thing I want to really, you're probably going to hear me talk about time and time again through this conversation is not only just um, his ability along with other people that support him and play with him, the ability to create that magical hook. And yeah. it could be in his vocals, could be in his guitar work. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, something within a song can just grab you like that mm -hmm. and make you feel sad, make you feel alive, make you feel mm -hmm. whatever it is. So um, with... Ian's work. And um, can you just talk about that care album? Yeah. Um, you know, after the original mirrors, um, he had gotten together with, uh, or Ian had gotten together uh, with Paul Simpson from a band called the wild swans. And they had formed a duo called care. And I believe they only released three singles mm -hmm. during their existence. They never released an album. But then when uh, Lightning Seeds took off, of course, the labels went back into their catalogs and they released that original Mirrors um, compilation and they released this Care compilation, which, of course, uh, Paul, Paul Simpson uh, sings lead vocals uh, and they chose a picture with Ian Brody in the uh, foreground, uh, you know, obviously to you know capitalize on his success. But this is actually a CD that contains uh, all the release material and I believe some stuff that they have recorded for the album that was never released and you get 12-inch mixes and stuff. It's very poppy. Uh, 
I would say, you know, definitely more lightning seeds than original mirrors. It was a sort of almost a precursor to lightning seeds. Uh, I can imagine lightning seeds featuring Paul Simpson if, if that uh, um, partnership had, had uh, moved in, you know, forward into the future. And there are some real gems on that. Um, oh. um, we could have a whole nother discussion. On yeah, that. exactly. Right. So let's actually get into the impact. I want to know before we start ranking stuff, what does this band mean to you? How does it tug at the heartstrings? How does it, what does, what does, what do the lightning seeds mean to you? I'm an emotional listener. Everything that I listen to, I feel. And if I obviously feel, or if I don't feel anything, I don't connect with it. Um, Lightning Seas is a band that works on many levels uh, in terms of, of being an emotional listener because you can feel the joy that Ian has in creating the music. You can feel the joy that exudes from these great wonderful melodies and hooks uh like you said that could be maybe um maybe a harmony of backing vocals or or it could be a guitar hook or a little twinkle of the keyboards um sometimes that's why i love when you hear like 12 inch mixes of songs because they take that stuff apart and they and they put it back together again uh and sometimes you know if there's not a remix whatever sometimes it takes you numerous listens you know, you could be five, 10 listens in and then go, God, I never noticed that little horn thing at the end of each uh, chorus. And then, you know, you're hooked again. There's so many layers to this music and it's an emotional, uh, you know, it's an emotional experience because there's so much that comes out of it. You know, whether it's a sad song, you feel that if it's a joyful song, you feel that, uh, you know, if, uh, it, it's just, you know, on the surface, some people may just go, ah, oh, they're just a pop band, but no, that's, that that's how Ian Brody is deceptive. He may draw you in just yeah. as being uh, you know, a pop artist, but then he drags you down into this pool of, of, of wonderfulness that um, I, I, I still enjoy to this very day. I want to read a, the way you described that was perfect. And um, I want to give you a quote here uh, that Ian said, this is, um, he says, I think all my songs are about the fear of change. And they're all about making sure you love this moment, this bit, because it might not happen again. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that quote? I, I it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, as everyone knows, emotions and life and love and joy and happiness, passion, that stuff can be fleeting, you know, uh, and, and, and us being humans, uh, you know, sometimes this stuff doesn't crack the skulls or crack the heart of some people. Uh, and other people, I think, you know, they'll just push it off, but other people will accept it and know that, that, you know, this is a moment that I will cherish right now. But, and, and, I may not feel this way about other music or other things, but I will carry this into the future. And, and, you know, I will, you know, a lot of our, our, our emotions are just basically just memories that we just unwrap like Christmas morning. And, um, and that's what his music is, is in my opinion, really all about. I'm going to ask you a tough question here. Uh Oh, I got to go. No. <laughs> what have you learned about yourself or the way that you listen to music and having the lightning seeds part of your musical experience? What have you learned? That's probably tough because uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> and and I, I, I think it's, It's really about um, listening to things, you know, like I alluded to a little while ago about, you know, listening to things below the surface yeah. and uncovering things because you can listen to a Lightning Seas album now and realize, oh, I love this a lot more than I thought I did. Or 
it's not really that it's no, it just sounds better with each listen. And it, it opens in a way it opens you up to these wonderful opportunities of, of accepting, even accepting things you didn't care for before, you know, like maybe a certain song. Um, and it really just, just getting it, it's hooks in you and, and, or in me and, maybe even uh, shining a light, you know, because when you listen to this music, you're, you know, you want to share it and you want to yeah. connect with people. Yes. And it's, it, yeah. So that probably didn't answer that question, but it allowed me to talk. And I like talking about the lightning seeds. And I want to piggyback off that. Sometimes within the music, there are moments where it's that melody. It's the hook that we've talked mm -hmm. about. There's a lot for me. It's that romantic feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be embracing someone that you dearly love. It could be embracing that moment. Mm -hmm. You're watching a beautiful sunset. You're eating this delicious food. It, it bursts with the colors of life, right? And the lyrics, his lyrics, I absolutely appreciate because he does it in a very clever way at times. And one of my favorite lines is this from a song, <laughs> all, I, um, all I Want. I've always loved this line. Mm -hmm. um, all I want, all I want to do is make you listen from now on. Cardboard men are strong, but paper can be torn. Mm -hmm. You better listen from now. I've always loved that beautiful metaphor. Um, so, yeah, let's not forget the power of his lyrics. Yes. Okay. Let's take a dive into some of the uh, the rankings of the album. Okay. And um, should we start with numero seven? Numero seven. We are going to start. Okay. Now, this is – I'm not comparing uh, Lightning Seas to the Beatles. Uh, but it's just like, you know, ranking your – favorite Beatles album, you know, you, it's like, do you really love revolver over rubber soul or, or over Abbey road? Maybe today you do, but they're all great albums. And that's what I'm going to say about, you know, and I'll tell you why number seven is four wins. This was like the first album that had, Oh gosh, darn it. Let me find my notes here because, uh, uh, I'm terrible. As I told you earlier, I'm absolutely terrible with, with, uh, release dates. Um, this album actually came out in 2009 and the, this seems to me to be, uh, you know, he had put out a solo album, you know, a few years before this, and this seems to be like about halfway through a, a new solo album. You know, his label said, ah, come on in, you know, put it out as the lightning seeds. So then like the last, you know, second half of the album he recorded as the lightning seeds. So, Song wise, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you know, the title track is great. Ghosts, uh, yeah. don't walk on by, uh, great songs. But the problem is, is it sounds half like an Ian Brody solo album, which is great, and half like a Lightning Seas album. And that's why it's number seven on my list. Um, it's still wonderful songs. He's a wonderful songwriter, no matter what genre he's writing in. His solo stuff is more acoustic based, uh, but. Really, really wonderful stuff. I love the album cover. Yes. It's uh, wonderful. And that came out in 2009. Yes. So with that album, that's the, I love the first song, Four Winds. Mm -hmm. Really builds and swells. Let's go to your number six. My number six. Okay. Well, First off, I did I did want to show you Ian Brody did have a solo album that came out <laughs> called Tales right. Told. Um, I, I did want to show you that. I, I don't want to forget it. My number six, again, only because we've had less than a year to digest it. It's called See You in the Stars. And it's a wonderful, absolutely wonderful album. But we've had a few decades to ingest everything else. Yeah. Uh, and we've only had a year to ingest this. So that's why it's my number six. It, it continues in the vein of the lightning scene stuff off of uh, Four Winds, but
But, you know, I mean, like Losing You is a great track. Uh, Emily Smiles, I think that was a single. Uh, yeah. Green Eyes is great. Sunshine, um, Walk Another Mile. Still a very, very strong album. Um, but, you know, as I said, number six, because I haven't had uh, as much time to hear it and to ingest it as the others. Interesting that you picked that as number six, because my number six mm. was Tilt. Oh. Tilt. Yes. And again, it's like you were, you were making the analogy of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. A lot, so much great body of work here to sift through and just a great, uh, and it's difficult at times. So here's how I, just to give people an idea how I rank these albums. I listen to the tracks. It's great revisiting some of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I rank each song one through five, five being the highest. And then I would t add them up and then do the average. Mm -hmm. and then whatever the average score was, that's, and then I started ranking them. So with Tilt, um, came out in 1999. I picked that as my number six. It's a good album, absolutely. Uh, I love it. To me, it has a flavor of Pet Shop Boys to it. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of that New Order experimentation going on with the disco and the in the in the electronica spirit um there's a song here uh sweet soul sensation yeah track number two great great number two track sometimes i feel like people talk about first tracks last tracks of an album but i mm -hmm. think the number two should get some more love to, um that's just my opinion yeah um yeah. Great, great. It has that dubby bounce to it. Mm -hmm. And then City Bright Stars, I know, is a popular one. Uh, however, my favorite track from that album is track number seven, and that is Get It Get It Right. I love Curtain, but Curtain with Terry Hall. Yes, yes. One of his uh, co-pilots, right? Yes. Um, love the tempo on that. But to me... Um, I know he, he, I don't think he thinks of himself as a great vocalist, but I think the vocals on that song, fabulous. So I'm picking that 1999 Tilt as my number six. He he is a great vocalist. And one thing I noticed about this ranking, you know, going through and picking the albums and stuff is his best collaborator was Terry Hall. And we all know that Terry Hall passed away. Terry Hall from the specials, the Colorfield, Fun Boy 3, uh, Terry Blair and Anushka, and uh, then back to the specials again, wonderful artist. And plus Ian worked on uh, Terry's solo albums with him. And it just seems like almost every one of my favorite Ian Brody tracks or Lightning Seas tracks was co-written by Terry Hall. But I mean, so he had a lot of other great co-songwriters like uh, Ian McNabb, uh, Peter Coyle from the Lotus Eaters uh, and um, Alison Moyer, he, he co-wrote a song. But my number five, is tilt <laughs> yeah and life's too short's a great song uh if only uh you know like you said you know get it right uh just uh, t tales of the riverbank this is i think it's again it's a absolutely wonderful album i think it was recorded a couple years after the yeah it was recorded like three years after the previous album and i think the, sort of the 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 uh, things were winding down. I mean, I mean, that was our last album for what, 14 years or something or something like that or 10 years. Crazy. So you are known as the CD junkie. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you this question before we can go back into this. Do you have any vinyl? <sighs> not really. No, I've, I've not taken that dip back. I, I want to walk into a store and for, let's say, Suggested retail price. I see a three CD expanded Tears for Fears, The Hurting, or two CD, whatever, and it's nineteen ninety nine. Oh, I'm going to pick that up, right? But if I decide, well, gosh, I'm going to buy the nine track LP, that's almost double the price. So, do I want to pay twenty bucks for thirty tracks, or do I want to pay um, thirty bucks for nine tracks? I'm going to stick with CDs. Plus, you know, my hearing has always been off. Uh, I, I, I miss some frequencies that, you know, you can hear easily. Um, some, sometimes I can't hear birds chirping. Uh, in, in fact, a lot of times there's a lot of frequencies I can't hear. So CDs are going to be fine with me. I, I, I don't feel that warmth that other people feel. 
just had to ask because I'm, I'm yeah. Um, okay, so that was your number five. Yeah, my number five is Dizzy Heights. Mm. Dizzy Heights, and um, again, so you alluded to the Beatles. I have no idea. I was not in his mind during that time. The album came out in 1996. Um, I was in college at the time, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And when I first heard the album, I was thinking, boy, this has Beatles written all over it and Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. And it just had that spirit. It had that energy. It had some of that punch. Um, and it actually has one of my favorite, favorite Lightning Seed song of all time. And that is Fishes on the Line. Mm -hmm. that guitar work towards the end. And I think that's a great closer. Um, of course, you know, well known for Sugar Coated Iceberg, Beautiful Horns. The album sounds very lush, very full sounding to me. Yeah. So I'm thinking that number five. And remember, that came was riding off the coattails of the huge success of Jollification. So I wonder, like, okay, how similar did he want to make that album and how different from the previous Right, one? right, right. Uh, yeah. By the way, we, we, we just got a response from a possible guest, and they uh, the link is not working for them, so they're downloading Chrome. Okay. Um, so. Thank you for letting us know, this mystery guest. Um, okay, so that was my number five. Let's go to number four. Okay, I'm just responding to him. Okay. Uh, number four, uh, I I guess you and I are on the same um, on the same wavelength because because my number four is Dizzy Heights. Okay. And yeah, it it's it it it's got so, in my opinion, you know. I, I look at this, I'm, I'm surprised because I think really the only big track on this album was his cover version of, you know, the, uh, uh, the turtles track or the, the song the turtles are most known for called you showed me. Uh, but you know, there was like a sh sugar coated iceberg. Uh, 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 one of my favorite tracks would be like, what if, mm -hmm. and, um, imaginary friends, you bet your life. Yep. It, it's a solid album. I do agree with you that, that, Again, it it's really hard to to say that it, he's never released a bad a bad record at all, and um, but Dizzy Dizzy Heights had to fall somewhere, so it fell in my number four. You talked about when you listen to the Lightning Seeds, mm -hmm. you may not hear these little accents that they incorporate. And I love this album because it, when I listen on headphones and I was picking mm -hmm. up things, I'm like, oh, I, I didn't, I didn't notice that before. Yeah. Um, so I, I just kind of put that in my notes, and I love the line, "Remember all my Mersey skies." I just, I love that. And um, yeah, and there are some songs here that uh, you know I've always, if I ever had the chance to speak with Ian, how much was his work? appreciation like what does he feel about brian wilson mm -hmm. do you know anything any knowledge no okay. no i have i have no inclination but i do know that um like on on dizzy heights that's uh you know you bet your life is very beach boys uh it it, it reminded me of, of of beach beach boys uh, in terms of the arrangements, you know, like the bass and all that stuff. Uh, but it also reminded me of like Don't Sleep in the Subway by uh, Petula Clark, which was basically uh, uh, inspired by the Beach Boys. So um, that whole Brian Wilson thing, I'm, I'm sure he's a fan because you can hear yeah. bits and pieces of, yeah. of Brian throughout his catalog. All right, let's go to the next one. So that was your number? That was my four. four. Yeah. My number four? Sitting right here. Yep. Sense. All right. This album is pretty damn amazing. Came out in 1992. I was a senior in high school. 
And I remember when it came out. Okay, so Life of Riley had been playing on the radio here all, mm -hmm. all over. And I remember when the, came, the album came out. At my high school, there was a, uh, a parking lot, a very small parking lot that you people just hung out in. It was outside the actual main parking lot. And when I got the album, <laughs> I ditched school the, the, the afternoon. I mm -hmm. went over this parking space, put the CD in, and just kind of lied back and took it all, took all those sounds in. Mm -hmm. And you kick off that album with sense. Holy yeah. smokes. I mean, the pogo feel to it. It's like, okay. Get me in that rocket ship. I'm ready to take off with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, again, to me, it does have a little bit of that Pet Shop Boys flair to it. Mm -hmm. And I love it. It's got the harmonica going on. Um, I, I was feeling that Manchester scene is mm -hmm. right in that period, maybe a little bit after. Mm -hmm. But you go from sense then you knock it out of the park with one of your most anthemic songs, Life of Riley. Yep. Then you go into Blowing Bubbles, you know, Where Flowers Fade. And then it mm -hmm. just kind of goes down back, you know, tempo goes down a bit. And then it has another one of my favorite Lightning Seeds tracks, which I feel people don't talk about, is mm -hmm. Maroon. Yeah. Maroon. Mm -hmm. Love that song. And then Happy has that kind of hollow notes um appeal to it but yeah that is definitely my number four album that was <laughs> um yeah and of course big admirer of that album cover yes like so many so many all right Absolutely. so what is um my number three yeah <sighs> side by side again <laughs> sense ah. is my is my number three uh this of course the song sense uh, you know, just the other day I watched the video to sense and Terry Hall is actually in the video. I don't know if anybody, and I think Terry Hall did that on his first solo album as well. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, sense is, is great. Life of Riley was the song. I think that it, that, that might've been the first single. Um, I, I, you know, I could be wrong. Blowing bubbles is great. Happy, which was co-written by Ian McNabb from the icicle works and solo. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's another great track. Uh, Small Slice of Heaven, which is another song co-written with Terry Hall. Just wonderful. And and I think this doesn't hurt it for me, but sometimes uh, when you listen to any album from a certain period, this is very early 1990s sounding, you know, production wise and, you know, the, the sound of the uh, instruments and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't uh, detract from the fact that the songs are absolutely killer. Ian Brody, just, I think that he burps melodies. Just burps <laughs> great hooks, you know. You he, know, he does. And I, I love that imagery. And someone else that burps melodies and is very attuned to what you just talked about. We have a very special guest here. Um, goes by the name of Boots. Um, can we bring Boots in, Mr. Bring Boots on. All right. Boots, can you Hello, hear us? America. Ian, oh. ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ian McNabb. What, I got so, Ian. Ian McNabb is the only oh, artist oh, in oh, this oh, universe oh, that can oh, get away oh, with oh, writing a song called I'm a Genius, and you believe <laughs> every word of it. How are you doing, guys? Good. Hello, thank you for Ian. being here. Yes, thank you no for problem. being part of uh, this uh, surprise event number one. As you know, we are talking about the lightning seeds. My name is W. We're here with Steve Schneed, CD Junkie. And now we have our very, very special guest, Ian McNabb. Like, would you share to tell, mind telling us your experience, any lightning seeds experience working with Ian, any of other musicians? Yeah, well, um, I was. Uh, how long have you got, by the way? <laughs> Take your time, my friend. Take I, your was, time. I, I, I was uh, very aware of uh, Ian's work um, coming from Liverpool. He was a, a, a 
well, still is a local legend, and not just a local legend, a, a, a global legend. And um, I was first aware of his work as a guitar player in a band called Big in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, which was one of the first kind of punk new wave acts that we had here in Liverpool in, I think, about 1978. It might have even been 1977. And that band consisted of um, Ian Brody, Jane Casey, Holly Johnson, Bill Drummond, Budgie, um, and I think Paul Rutherford from Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I'm not quite sure about that. Please, I don't, the memory is going, but I, I intend to try and do that for you. Um, and then um, he became a producer. I think the first thing he did was he, he, he remixed a couple of tracks from Echo and the Bunnymen's first album, and he recorded and produced Rescue, which I believe was their second single, first on uh, Warner's Corova. And, you know, he was, he was omnipresent on the scene. He was a cool guy, you know, and, and he was one of those guys that you're like, how do you get to be as cool as that, you know? Because I was in, I was little, just a little bit younger than all those guys. And I was in cabaret bands. You know, we were doing uh, working men's clubs around the, the north of England, playing playing cover songs of the day, you know, doing covers, basically. Not cool. Well, it, it was cool to me at the time, but it wasn't cool. Yeah. And then, um, you know, we got to we got to know each other and you know i you know watched his career with great interest he had a band called care which i'm sure you've discussed mm -hmm. and then after i think it was our second album uh we bumped into each other in in a in a drinking establishment in town um, and we got talking more talking more than we we'd ever done before and uh he agreed to have a listen to some of my new songs and uh, maybe have a crack at working together, see how we got on, you know, get in a, in a rehearsal room and uh, just see what, what happens if we get on, you know, because we got on as people. But, you, you know, that doesn't mean you're going to get on working together. That, that's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what we did. And he ended up producing uh, uh, a song called Understanding Jane, a song called Evangeline, a song oh, called Who Do You Want For Your Love? And then he did the whole of the high school works third album if you want to defeat your enemy sing his song so we spent a lot of time together you know i call him i call him in the, the pop detective because <laughs> uh, he's like he's like a musical columbo you know yeah he he'll find he'll find the hit you know Excuse me, I just got one more idea for a chorus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, you know I, I learned so much from him. I mean, just listening to records with Ian Brody was was, was a great learning thing, you know. Because mm. you'd, go yeah, so you'd go around to his house and you'd go around to his house and he'd have a cup of tea and and a bite to eat, and then he'd just start putting videos on, or and he'd just sit there with his mouth open in awe, you know. You'd go around at like 11 30 a.m on a wednesday and he'd be listening to jacques brel you know <laughs> <laughs> and then of course that that inspires you to you know I, I love that hang on a sec i've just got a chair problem um i love that when when somebody is that enthusiastic and it makes you you know to get you to listen to things that you wouldn't normally listen to mm -hmm. and he did all of that with me it was very much like a like a, a Yoda thing with, with the yeah, so, yeah. I th I thought he brought a lot out. He like like he, Ian McNabb. Uh, you know, everybody knows I'm 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 a, a big fan of Ian. Uh, and on if you if you want to defeat the enemy, you know Ian or Boots writes these incredible melodies, and sometimes it could be. You know, on the first album, these great songs, you know, you might be paying attention more to Chris Sherrick's drumming or uh, Chris Leahy's bass, whatever, to forget these melodies. But I think on that third album, he lifted the melodies up. Uh, and and on If You Want to Defeat the Enemy, that was an album that I remember just blowing me away because 
it's like here were the songs. This is, uh, you know, the Icicle Works were always a great band, but that's the album that really, in my opinion, showcased the songs. I'm just surprised the album never became as huge as as, as it should have been. Just incredible piece of work. I thought it was huge. <laughs> well, not here in America. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I know I, I'm slightly, being slightly facetious. Sorry, yeah. I, I, and you know, I don't judge it that way. I mean, I, I think if you if you kind of wait for music to be validated by commercial success and yeah. uh, critics giving you five star reviews, I think it's you're kind of on a hide into nothing there. I mean, yeah. I, my direct kind of link to the the muse has always been, I just want to make records that I'm really happy with. And mm-hmm. to put them out, and I, I, I think the the time that the, a record is really judged isn't when it comes out and when you're spending a fortune, you know, getting it adverts and t- taking out full page ads in trade magazines so that you get five star reviews, or uh, you know, slipping DJs little gifts under the counter so they'll put you on, on the playlist. You know, <laughs> I don't really think that that's where it's at. I think time. Yeah, time is what decides it, you know. And I, you know, I just think it's so great. Uh, I don't want to take this away from Ian Brody because this is the Ian Brody moment, not mine. But I think it's great that. Uh, but but I'll talk about me for a minute. Yes, please uh, do. I, I I think it's. I mean, I, I'm I'm a big fan of streaming. Not mm. in terms of that it's going to make me be able to, you know put an extension on my house. I don't think it's about money, and it certainly isn't going to allow me to put an extension on my house. You know, far from it. You get paid diddly squat streaming. But what you do get is the chance for people to hear your music that wouldn't even think about yeah. buying anything. You know, I've discovered so many artists through mm-hmm. Spotify and, you know, and the other streaming platforms that are available. And I love that thing that they have on Spotify where it goes, you go scroll down to the bottom and it goes, people also liked. You know, I was listening to uh, Paul Westerberg the other day, a big Paul Westerberg fan. And, you know, I was like, oh, what's this? And I went down and said, people also like. And I, I think there was a band called Crash and Bang, Crash Bang, uh, something right. like that. Right. Anyway, they sound they're very much in the same idiom and high level of melodic songwriting and nice jangly guitars and great production and concise, great pop stroke rock music. And I, you know, that's opened up another avenue for me. So now I'm into that. And if I like something streaming, I'll then I'll, I'll do a YouTube thing, make sure that the lead singer doesn't look like a dick. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, now, Ian, was and, that song? Was that group? Was that group Batch and Pop? That's the one. Yeah, See, because it's to- it's Tommy Stinson from The Replacements. Right. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Tommy Stinson. So there's the connection. And of yeah. course, Tommy was in The Replacements, and then he went on to play bass with Guns and Roses. Yep. So there we go. So, and I did. I didn't know that. Okay. Anyway, so I go down that road, and then if you go to their page, then you go to another thing, and then before you know it, it's time to go to bed. You know. <laughs> and it's like, what happens? I was going to do so much today, and I, and I absolutely love that. So, just going back briefly to my point, um, I think that you know, certainly since like um, "Whisper to a Scream, Birds Fly," as you call it over there, mm-hmm. was in Stranger Things. I mean, the, the listening numbers on the Icicle Works have gone through the roof, you know. And hopefully some people will get to hear some of the other music. Maybe some of them will make the connection and mm-hmm. listen to yeah. my song. So, so, so I'm cool with all of that. But um, Defeat Your Enemy, the, the album that Ian did with us, it was the the album that had so many uh, near misses with what you're talking to regards success in the UK and Europe as well. It's like all those singles where they got played on the radio loads and they just nearly, nearly bust into the 40, but not mm. quite. And thank God they didn't. Because I, I honestly think that um, if we would have become as big as, I don't know, one of those bands that wasn't massive but did pretty well, say a band like 
big country or mm-hmm. uh, you know I don't know something like that. I'm, I'm trying to think. You you know I'm remembered in America or not remembered but known for one song and that's fine by me because it's better than no songs and it yeah. me it means that I don't get asked to do all of those fucking nostalgia festivals you know where the wheel you're on and you play your four hits and it's let's pretend it's 19 fucking 83 again <laughs> no, I don't have to get asked to do that because I've only got one yeah, and I know that if I did have those songs, and they paid me enough money, I'd do it. And then all yeah. of a sudden, you backed into a corner whereby that's what you do. You're known for this. I mean, with all due respect to the great Nick Kershaw, I think he's a wonderful talent, and he was a big, big success. He does all that stuff, and it is his his work is laid out as he goes on, and everybody wants to hear those couple of songs. Mm-hmm. Or I don't get asked to do those things, so I just stay within my little confines, and I can play it and do anything I want, you know. So that's kind of that's a, that's a cool thing. Yeah. And all the music's still there. You, another funny thing is those songs. Those songs, when I play them live, they get treated like they were hits, and and that's that's pretty cool, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Ian. You, you for um sure. you worked on Cloud Cuckoo Land. Yeah. Uh, I know Henry well, Priest. I, I, I that I, I that was that I think was that the second like the second second. Album? first one. Yeah. Well what happened was um we were working um on high school work stuff. Um, yeah. And Ian used to use an engineer, and we used to use an engineer, a place called Amazon Studios, just outside, outside Liverpool, um, called Pete Coleman. And Ian was like, oh, you know, I've... Ian was con- conscious of his voice, which I didn't think he had any need to be at all, you know. But I think he was a bit, kind of, you know, because he, he worked with, sometimes worked with people like Ian McCullough and me, who were very sort of, you know, Gilbert Oak Sullivan, you know, you know, <laughs> and uh, he, he didn't, he didn't do that. Although he was very good at, at, at producing those kind of singers, and he, his voice is obviously very different. And I'm not, I'm not taking any credit for it because he, he knows exactly what he's doing. But me and Pete both kind of went, "No, come on, man!" And, and so Ian asked me if I'd produce his demos. I, I mean, produce the vocal session, and by mm-hmm. that he meant have a listen through to me singing it and make any comments you want and you know and that's what we did and he did about three tunes i think one was called war goes on um there was another one oh gosh honestly it was so long ago i'm not sure of the titles but they were great songs you know the very embryonic lightning seeds things great chords great production very catchy um and ian singing and once he got used to that, then he was off. And so Cloud Cuckoo Land, I think he asked me to do... I don't know if I did backing vocals on that one, but he, he asked me to, to write some... Did I? Okay. He asked me to write some lyrics for, for a, a backing track he'd done. And I think on, on that album, it might have been a song called um, Happy. Yeah. Um, I think so, which was... A, it was kind of a, a riff on a... A tramp uh, on a sorry on a track called Tramp, doom, do, 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 do. Um, so I did that, and on Jollification, which was the breakthrough record he yeah. did, I I wrote the lyrics for a song called Feeling Lazy, mm-hmm. and I did, I did backing vocals on one or two tracks on that album, yeah, and also on Sense too, uh, you. Did I? Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, on um, on sense on sense you do. Um, uh, uh, no, actually, happy was on was on sense, and then uh, oh, yeah, happy was on sense, and then feeling lazy. Uh, you did. Uh, in fact, that was almost like a, nearly a duet. You know, because your voice was out in front during some of the parts. Actually, 
you know, backing vocals, but you can very clearly hear you. Well, I'd, I'd remember doing um, "Put Your Foot Down and Drive." I think that's yeah. Me. Mm -hmm. And and Terry Hall did did uh, the Taste of Love. He did that. Yeah. Like, I don't know because because Ian, you know, had, had me sing quite a lot of stuff. I, in fact, I, I think I remember the session. Um. And he played me maybe four or five tunes. Mm -hmm. And can you sing this? And I can't remember if Terry was already on it and then I added to it, or if mm -hmm. I sang it and then Terry added to it, or if it was just Terry and not me, or if there was one that was, where it was just me and not Terry. I can't remember. I haven't got the CDs in front of me to, mm -hmm. to jog me memory. But yeah, there was a lot of stuff, you know. And also, when Ian was going around, because I, I don't think he had a full time band at this point. Um, so when he'd have to go and do promo uh, at radio stations and whatnot, I'd do a couple of those with him as well. I'd just turn up with an acoustic guitar and, you know, do a bit of backing vocals, a bit of strumming. And, mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun and it was exciting. And I mean, the, the first record that came out was a song called Pure. Yes. And, um, which is such a classic, you know. Um, I didn't have anything to do with that. I just heard it and thought, wow. And that became a hit. And then it started up, you know, and it, and it was uh, it was great to see. And the, the other thing that I love about Ian is, uh, you know, as cool as he is and as, as cool as he was perceived, he was never afraid of going, you know, pop. Music, you know, pop yeah. music, you know, the big strawberry and it, it's pop and jollification yeah. and it was all up and, and it was happy. And, it, you know, it, it, those mm -hmm. records make you feel good, you know, because, yeah. he, he, you know, I mean, he's produced The Fall, for Christ's sake, and The Bunny <laughs> Men and, and lots of kind of uh, things like that. Yeah. I'm just going to get my wire to to plug my computer in because I, I was in such a hurry there to connect with you. So if you just punch me out for a second, I'll come back when I plug this yeah. back in. How's that? Okay. okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. This is W, host of the High Art on the Edge page. I'm here with the CD junkie, Steve Schnee, and legendary frontman from the band, Phil Lars, too. Ian McNabb has joined us in this conversation. Yes, the icicle works. Uh, you know, we're talking about the lightning seeds. So, um, the, uh, Ian worked with, uh, uh, or Ian McNabb or Boots worked with, uh, Ian Brody, uh, you know, back in the day, he just explained that. And, um, okay. He's plugging it in now. I think he's back on there, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it just, I think that, uh, uh both, uh, Ian McNabb and, and Ian, I always thought that Ian, Ian McNabb, Ian Brody, and Ian McCulloch should have formed a band called the Three Ins. <laughs> so, Ian, if you don't mind, oh, can, you, can you mute? We're getting feedback. Or just so, lower your volume a little bit, maybe. Yeah. How's that? Testing one, two. That's better. Hello. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So, what, what is what is up with is the better? Ian Liverpool, yeah. as as Steve alluded to? What you, Ian Brody, Ian McCulloch? Do you ever think about that? There's something about Liverpool. <laughs> I don't know. It's funny, you know, because when I mean my my first name's Robert, mm -hmm. um, but. I've always been called Ian, and I was never able in all my years with my parents, was never able to get a sensible answer as to why they called me Ian, you know, because my name's Robert Ian McNabb, but I always got called <laughs> Ian. And uh, neither, neither of them are here now, so I, I, I definitely, that's it, it's shrouded in mystery forever mm -hmm. now. But um, Ian, it was, and when I was at school, and growing up in Liverpool in the 60s and 70s, I didn't know anybody called Ian, you know. And it was kind of skittered out a bit because it, you know, probably, you know, it's a bit sort of, uh, I don't know, it's not, it wasn't a rock and roll name is what I'm saying, you know what I mean? It, it was a bit sort of fey. 
um, something you might call, uh, you know, a, an author of, of a book about trout fishing. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> it wasn't. A, it well, it wasn't a rock and roll name. It was before Ian Curtis. You know. Yeah. Well, actually, there was Ian Hunter. So you know, shame on me for saying that. <laughs> uh, but I wasn't particularly aware of any musicians when I, when I was being skitted at from a name. And then when all the the new wave stuff started, everybody was called Ian. And there was Ian McCulloch, Ian Brody. There's uh, a guy in Liverpool, a good friend of ours called Ian Ian Prose. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know one of Echo and the Bunny Men's managers called Peasy because his name was Ian. A <laughs> skinny, my guitar tech, his name is Ian McFarlane, so we call him Skinny. So everybody has to have nicknames. That's why I've got the, the boots because if you one day uh, we were we were in Amazon Studios, and I don't know how many of us were there, but the phone went and it was somebody ringing up for Ian and Skinny, my who was um, a tape op at the time. Uh, who, who then became my guitar tech. His name's Ian as well. So somebody rang up and went to, hey, can I speak to Ian? And, and he went, which one? <laughs> and I said, I Ian, Ian Mack. And he said, which Ian Mack? <laughs> <laughs> Both me, me and McCulloch were there. And it was Ian Brody that he was looking for. And he was there too. So, you know, if you, oh. if you walk into like a, a, a music-related situation in Liverpool and shout Ian, Half the room will turn around and look at you. <laughs> so I'm not really sure. I guess, it, it, you know, it became popular because, you know, I was born in 1960. Uh, Max, about 18 months older than me, Ian, about the same. So obviously around about 1958, up to 60, up to 64, Ian was a popular name. I'm trying to think maybe there was um, a very popular actor or somebody was famous who was called Ian in, in the in that time frame. Yeah. Amazing. It is funny so, though. I have a, one more question and then I'd love for you to share with us what you're doing right now just in case people aren't aware of your solo work, any tours, any albums, anything sure. you want to share. But here's yeah. a question for you. I want I've never been to Liverpool. I'm I'm gonna get there one day because of what we're talking about, the spirit of the music here. What is in the Liverpool water <laughs> that has created so many great artists? What the hell is going on over there? Well, Dubya, um, as you can probably imagine, it's not the first time that I've been asked that question. I know. In fact, we got asked that question on American stand, uh, American Bandstand by Dick Clark. Whoa, name drop, ding! <laughs> And, and the, uh, the the answer is still a mystery to me, but I will say this. Um, you know, what, what is it, uh, being, to, to paraphrase somebody else, being born in Liverpool brings with it certain responsibilities. I was not a, a fan of music or interested in it um, until I was about 12. I was previously interested in, you know, football, soccer, as you guys call it. I was very interested in the American space program because this was what was going on. And I was into all that stuff. I wasn't really into music because it just seemed a little trite, you know. And I only ever really got to hear stuff like, uh, you know, I don't know, the, the, the real big hits that were kind of not really my thing at the time. And then I got into it because of Mark Bolan, because I saw him on telly mm -hmm. when I was 11. And then, of course, eventually you come to the Beatles. Um, and then you just start unraveling. And it was a great time because the Beatles had broken up. I mean, the first Beatles record I bought was Let It Be. You know, imagine how that fucked with me brain, you know. Yeah. So I, I started backwards, you know. <laughs> Um, and then all of the, throughout the, the 70s, there was nothing about Liverpool. It was all in the past. It was all about Mersey Beat. And then with the punk and new wave explosion, we got this, mm -hmm. this incredible, you know, it was like the, 
most fantastic downpour after a, a terrible flood you know it you just couldn't move the music and and you know you could try and walk between the rain raindrops but it'd still get you you know and it was just bands 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 and you were just like wow this is and you thought do you know what you'd see them on tv and hear them on the radio and you think you've got a chance here so they did up your game you know i, re I remember hearing uh pictures on my wall by echo and the bunny man and i remember hearing uh bouncing babies by the teardrop explodes and electricity by orchestral maneuvers in the dark and you know i'm going wow you don't have to be able to play guitar like jeff beck to mm -hmm. be cool you know and that's what that was all about so everybody was just trying and, and basically the other the other thing was that unless you were into music then you had to be into football you know because you, otherwise you didn't have any mates so if you were into music you'd go to shows and everybody else was into it and not that you had to force yourself to be into it you were into it and it was just everywhere you went you know mccartney always says this thing about uh you know in liverpool everybody had to have a song you know and everyone like you tell it to do at the piano and stuff you know? and i'd be there you know? and that you know that's true to a certain extent but you never that was always a christmas or or summer holidays or something you know you, mm -hmm. you didn't that didn't go to oh i'm going to do this as a job but yeah. when you were doing this with all these other bands and that, and then you know somebody would come in and go hey we you know we just got a record deal with warners you know and you'd be like what <laughs> you you know you were on benefits last week how the hell does this even happen you know i must write a better song i must write a better song and that's when i went we are we are we are the children. <laughs> i hope Amazing. that answers the question thank so, you it, it, <laughs> Even if it didn't answer any question in the world, it was still an amazing answer. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a great storyteller, by the way, um, as well as your musicians. You. So well, tell, tell us, I do tell us talking about the, the form, you know. Uh, tell us before we get back into the ranking of the albums, and uh, you're obviously more than welcome to stay on if you like. But tell us what you're doing now. Uh, any solo work? Any upcoming tours? Anything you want to share? Uh, yeah i'm i'm still doing exactly the same as as i've always done um i've got a new i've just put a new record into the factory there which is called new brighton rock um and that's got 11 new uh, 10 new tracks on it and a, and a cover version of uh, i love the cover foreigners version. i want to know what love is yeah. and um mm -hmm. uh, yeah I, i've taken a little break now because i've been um We've been doing uh, shows for a year, pretty much every weekend. I only only play at weekends, which is cool because I only play in the UK, and uh, yeah. it's uh, a nice, easy pace at my advancing years. I don't I don't like travelling. I don't like getting on airplanes. I don't like sitting on tour buses. So this works out well for me. So we've got a little break, and then I'm just putting this album out, which hopefully out in August. Then more UK shows towards the end of the year and my next project the one that I've, I've just stopped working on to have a chat with you lovely people is an album called um, Fleetwood McNabb which is uh, an album of, of my interpretations of uh, songs throughout the whole Fleetwood Mac era because I find them a, a really fascinating band in, in terms of the fact that I like stuff from every era of mm -hmm. Fleetwood Mac and unlike other bands that have changed members where usually the constant is always the 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 songwriter the front person or the front persons the only constant in this band is the rhythm section and they get new people in to go up front and change the sound and they did do from the time peter green left until lindsey buckingham and stevie nicks showed up and of course they stuck with that until they couldn't and then they used other people and that was pretty interesting too so that's my next project and finishing off um part two of uh me, me uh, autobiography part two memoir um so yeah i'm busy and you know uh, you won't know w but um i was a full-time carer for my mother who sadly passed away just over a year ago 
So I've got yeah. I've got a, a a tremendous amount of time suddenly to fill, which is what I'm doing. I'm not I'm not sitting around waiting for days of our lives or reruns of Dallas, you know. And, and, Ian, and Ian, you also have plenty of love and support from all of us out here. Yeah, no, I know. I really appreciate that. I know the internet can be a, a, a double-edged sword, but uh, mm -hmm. I, it works great for me. You know, I, you're and, you're a little. Uh, you, you know what? I, you can still kind of have so much social interaction with people. I've discovered this through lockdown. Did so many of these interviews and stuff, and not just interviews, but talking to people on Zoom was something that I would have never have considered before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really cool just just to say hi, you know. And then you can go and do something else, you know. So, but uh, yeah, it's all good. Thank, thank you very much for asking, and thanks for letting me be a part of this. And uh, yeah. love you, Mr. Brody. Thanks for everything. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for being our very special special guest here. Much appreciated, and much success to you. And yes, your mom. I know you have, you have shared quite a bit about your mom on your posts over the past year, and it's uh, very touching comments and sad and funny and just full of life well i just yeah. i mean it's been cathartic for me because it's helped me a great deal yeah and the response that i've had by being i'm you know i'm pretty direct i tell it like it is i tend to, sh to shoot first and ask questions later which has caused me problems <laughs> but there we go. um facebook i, I think <laughs> I, th I think that um, I've had a lot of really, I mean, I'm talking a lot of really nice personal messages from people who've gone through, we all go through grief, we all go through illness, we all go through terrible things. And the one thing that, that is constant and assured is that it just feels a little easier if you know that you're not going through it alone. Yeah. And a lot of people have reached out to me and thanked me for my being candid about my feelings and you know not being a i'm you know i'm not a i'm i've got a tough exterior but i'm i'm just a, a soft center and a sh sharing the emotions i think really helps other people i hope it does i think it has done so that's been really nice absolutely and and for anybody out there um uh, if you haven't heard you know ian mcnab's T last 20 years of his, uh, uh, I mean, he, he's been, a, you know, a cottage industry unto himself and has released in many people, not just my opinion, but his best material. I mean, he's still, there's no one that I can think of in the game right now that 40 years after the first time I heard him, yep, there you go. 40 years after the first time I heard him, uh, that's Nabby Road. Yeah, you see, he, see, great album title too. You can buy or you can check out Ian's music and, and we have a little look. We have on the shopping channel, you know. Yeah, in Ian McNabb uh, Hey, listen, still, thanks a lot. It's not about me. This is about Ian. No, but you know what? You, you you're a special guest, so I wanted to make sure that people are going to say, "Hey, this guy's really cool. Let's go check out his music." If they're not familiar with you, uh, okay. I I feel bad if they're not familiar with you, but. You know, uh, th th they will be now. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Okay, you guys have a great uh, whatever. What the hell are you guys doing all day? Go to the <laughs> garden, for Christ's sake. What are you guys going to get jobs? I don't know. You on our, our next Goodbye. I'm out of here. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, Cheers. Ian. Thank you. All righty, that was Ian McNabb. Uh, Ian McNabb, the legend. What a what an artist he is. Uh, I, I I always let him know. I always let him know that he's still just an amazing artist. Um, but let's get back into the ranking. Let's do so. <laughs> it, so uh, it, it's like you have to breathe a little bit after yeah. you know take a little break after dealing with uh, McNabb because it's like wow, this is really that guy who sang this song and that song and that song and that song. You know, so many. yeah, so he's, many. he's a great right. guy and a great artist. Let's go to number three. Number three. I think I did my number three, um, okay. which was sense. Yes. Yes, you did. Okay. My number three, <laughs> this might surprise you. 
It's the second Flock of Seagulls album. <laughs> oh, okay. It is Cloud Cuckoo Land, and it was this was this was pretty difficult. I mm-hmm. mean, it's, it's, what an incredible first album, right? Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of people are very familiar with it. Um, 1989, high school. We talked about the radio, you know, the hit the, the when Pure came out, but. When you start an album, kick it off with All I Want, something like that. And those amazing lyrics I alluded to earlier, song after song, track after track, it it doesn't miss a beat. And I love um, I love the variety here. Mm-hmm. I love just going back to that time period in my mind. Some of the most amazing choruses ever put <laughs> <laughs> out there um there's a song called joy yeah. and it has that fraser chorus sound which i know you and i both really appreciate that band and of course that's the epic song the price so yeah i put that as my number three that was a tough one there we go right there nice this remix i prefer over the album version why uh, it just sounds, it, it, it's a whole different feel. Yeah. It's, it, it's more of an emotional feel to me. Yeah. Nice. I'm glad you had that. That's awesome. All right, let's do number two. Number two. And number two ain't the S word. Number two is, my number one and two were t- basically tied. And this morning, I finally chose that number two was Jonification. Ah. Nice. All what, right. Can I- what an, an incredible album filled with amazing songs. Lucky You, I think, is right up there with Pure as one of his greatest instantly lovable pop songs. But, you know, Change is great. And and um, uh, it, it it's super, super amazing. You've also got, uh, you know, Alison Moyer is on here. Of course, Ian McNabb, who, who, who we just spoke with. Feeling Lazy is on this album that, that we talked about. But um, my best day and Punch and Judy and telling tales and and uh, why 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 is another. This is a superb, absolutely superb album. And the saddest thing about this album is if you walk into any CD store right now and go to their like dollar ninety nine bins or whatever or dollar bins, this is there. And it's like no, this thing you should be paying a hundred dollars or, or or more for this album. It's so filled with with just awesomeness. So that was my number two. I it's very hard to disagree with that. And the fact that, you know, I had to be very honest. So when that album came out, I was in England at the time studying abroad. It was mm-hmm. right at the height of Britpop or right when it started to escalate. The album came out. Lucky You was there. Um, and then the um, blur pulp. Oasis, mm-hmm. they kind of had the more of the spotlight, and this mm-hmm. album kind of snuck underneath people's radar. Yeah, and it wasn't for me until Tim Burgess Charlatans did a listening party and 2020 mm-hmm. and kind of revitalized the interest in this album. And it had been a while since I had listened to it, and I remember that listening party experience, the Tim Burgess listening party on Twitter. And it just put me right back. I'm like, oh, my God, this is why it is <laughs> from start to finish, top shelf yeah. to bottom. Yeah. It is amazing album. And feeling lazy. Uh, and this is a total compliment because one of my other favorite bands, the Boo Radleys, that song always reminded me of the Oh, yeah. Boo Radleys feel to it. So and then Punch and Judy, I, I wrote here in my notes, almost the sped up version of the price. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you. Okay, so that was your number two, huh? Uh huh. All righty. Well, my number two. Again, this might shock people. See you in. Wow. The yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, why? <laughs> why? 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 What a remarkable return. 
Yeah. What uh, just an, an accomplished again? I think it's got all the pieces of his experiences working together, uh, coming together mm -hmm. as a producer, as a songwriter, and just these songs move quickly. And by the time it's over, you're like, "What the hell? That's over? That's all? no, no, no! I'm going to go back and hit play." And um, there are tracks in here that I think some of his most best vocal work. Uh, starts off with a great kind of uh, foot stomper, losing you. You talked about Emily Smiles. Mm -hmm. um, these big sweeping chorus on Great to Be Alive. Uh, and then one of my other favorite Lightning Sea song, Walk Another Mile, My Head is a Jungle, and it ends beautifully with See You in the Stars. And how do you, I mean, we've talked about the album covers. How do you not appreciate that? It, yeah. These album covers really speak to that feel within, right? Yeah, so, they, they 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 really reflect what or the feeling of that album. You yes, know. yes, and um, I don't know. I, I wasn't. Ex I knew when the, um, I had this feeling this album was going to be good. Mm -hmm. After like the sixth or seventh listen, I'm like, oh Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. How did he do it? Maybe that's the question we should be asking. How does he do it? So yes. that's my number two. Yeah. Number he, one. I, I think though that that uh seeing the stars, it's a prime example of a guy who is an emotional vocalist. Yeah. Because when he's singing losing you, you're thinking like, oh, wow. I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, you get that feeling sort of like right about here where you start feeling bad, you know, and, 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 and so he's able to express himself. And, and, and when it's joyful, he's able to express himself. It's really, really, really fantastic. So let's get to number one. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's got to be the first experience, which is, but it, it's so hard because now I'm thinking maybe jollification is number one, but I already talked about jollification, but this album, all I want, pure joy. Like I said, joy. I have the single version. I love the remix of that. It contains two non-album tracks, um, but also this contains the song uh, "Love Explode" or yeah, my eyes, yeah, yeah. Uh, "Love Explosion," which uh, the Three O'clock had done previously. You know, he had, he had written it, and uh, I think he produced that album. Um, and it just it's just a joyful pop record just from start to finish. And this was like, I couldn't believe, uh, you know, that this guy had been hiding uh, his, his vocals behind, um, you know, uh, you know, these other great vo vocalists. But then again, those, you know, Paul Simpson was great in care and, and um, uh, uh, Steve Allen was great in uh, original mirrors and stuff like that. But yeah, when he, when he opened up his vocals and became the lightning seeds, it's, it's just, it, it's hard to deny just what a great artist he is and has always been since the very beginning. If you wouldn't mind telling us from that album, what is your favorite track? Oh, it's always going to be pure. Yeah. And, and I'm not, okay, here's, you know, it, it's just like, you know how, you know, you know, you get married and, you know, you love your wife and, and you, you know, she's like the best thing for you and you're married for 50 years until you both pass away. But you still have a soft spot for that first girl you kissed back in um, junior high school. And that's what pure is. There may be songs on here that I love, love, love to death and I would love. But pure was that first song. Pure was the first kiss for the lightning scenes. And that's why that is still going to be my favorite song, even though I'll admit he's probably done songs that are better, but there's a difference between my favorite and the greatest. And yeah. in this case though, I, I think they both are pure. So my number one is sitting right there on that wall and I'm going to go grab it. Okay. <laughs> yes, it is jollification. This is the strawberry version, vinyl version. Supposedly, oh. <laughs> you open it and it's got the scent. Yeah. Um, or it's got the sense. 
<laughs> yes. Lightning seeds pun. <laughs> How, I mean, so I don't want to be so repetitive here, but to me, it, it, it is the perfect album. Yeah. It, it, when I listen to it time and time again, I'm just blown away by the engineering of it. The mixing sounds great. It just seems like all the stars were aligned here with all the artists you had mentioned, Ian McNabb, um, uh, Alison Moyet, Terry Hall. Um, if you want to dance, you dance. If you want to exercise to it, you want to exercise. If you want to write a poem, it's it has all these, um, it gives you the impetus to go live life. Yeah. And um you know, for a while, I never paid. I loved. I loved the strawberries. I never paid attention to the faces as the seeds. Mm -hmm. and, oh uh, yeah, it's that. almost creepy. <laughs> no, it's it's just it's it's a work of art that um, it is a shame. I think you said it beautifully. It's a shame to see it in any kind of bargain bin, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, it's my numero uno, and. Just um, this, it came with. I thought I think you would like this too. Before we close this conversation out, it came with a little slick of vinyl here. On the back side, so you have well, you have um, on the A side, you have this track, Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Sam, and then on the back you have a beautiful um, acoustic version of "Perfect." Oh wow! Yeah. So I and I was like, oh, "Who would be selling this?" <laughs> wow! I really would appreciate that. Yeah, so you like the deep dives and deeper cuts. Um, yeah. Anything Maybe. else you want to share about the lightning seeds that we haven't touched on, or anything? No, like just a. Just a, Ian Brody is just an in, inspirational and influential artist. You know, began just as a guitar player. You know, but you know, Ian had mentioned you know the group Big in Japan. I did not mention Big in Japan because I never heard. I know of. I've heard the legend of Big in Japan. I've never. I don't think that they ever actually ever recorded anything. Uh, and if they did, I have. I, I've never heard it. If, if anything, a single. But then you know, beginning with Original Mirrors, I've traveled that path. And listen, and I bought things because it was produced by Ian Brody. So when I bought the Icicle Works, if you want to defeat your enemy, it's like, oh my gosh, it's produced by Ian Brody. Amazing. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and then when I discovered that he was an artist himself with the lightning seeds, yeah, it's, it, it's been a long journey, like what, 40, 45 years or something. <laughs> it's amazing. 44 years. Yeah. And never seen him live. I've never seen him live. No, me neither. So, and in fact, whoever's watching this, and if you watch this later, actually, that's not true. They came to San Francisco, and I believe it was Slim's. And I want to say, what was at that show? Oh my goodness! I don't have any memorabilia merch to prove it. So maybe I, I maybe I have to go back to my ticket stubs. Um, this has been amazing, Mr. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And, you know, one of the things I, I, when I was doing all this research and homework about it, it's, it's fun to sit here and really explore these albums and hear the differences and the nuances and the similarities mm -hmm. and kind of what uh, pieces all this together. So thanks again for being uh, a guest here on the very first surprise event. Uh, and then just remind the viewers again, anything you want to talk about with your uh, work well check out my videos subscribe to my channel on youtube it's um you know just look for steven schnee that's steven with a p-h-e-n or just type in cd junkie schnee and it'll pull you to it i cover tons of stuff i've covered the lightning seeds and uh, uh you know in McNabb, you know, uh, I've, I've interviewed Ian McNabb for my Beach Blanket Fort Bingo show, and we're probably going to do one again. I'm probably going to do another sort of CD junkie uh, just devoted to his last 20 years of his career, just to bring that more into focus. Uh, and, um, but I've, yeah, I've got 
stacks upon stacks of CDs over here of artists that I'll be covering uh, and artists that we'll be interviewing. And um, it, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful journey for just some guy who, who loves music so much and uh, somehow has, has managed to uh, find a way to share that love and, and uh, uh, good or bad uh, I'm out there. And uh, you can catch me anytime you want, 24-7, uh, uh, by searching for my YouTube videos. Thank you. Much appreciated. And um, by the way, if you like this event, feel free to comment. Anything you want to share about the lightning seeds and your experiences, we'd love to see them posted. Uh, surprise event number two coming up July 1st. We're going to be focusing on... the Beastie Boys. So that will be surprise event number two. Thank you all. My name is W, also known as William, host of the High Art on the Edge page. Thank you to Steve Schnee. And of course, thank you to Ian McNabb. Thank you, Ian McNabb. Ian Brody, Lightning Seeds. Big round of applause to you. Take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody.